Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Silvana Falcone, and I'm an associate professor of Latin American and Latino studies and the founder and director of UC Santa Cruz's Human Rights Investigations Lab. I'm also the director of the Research Center for the Americas here at UC Santa Cruz. This event is being co-sponsored by the RCA and the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. Before we fully get underway, I want to acknowledge the land where UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley sit. UC Santa Cruz sits on the unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking Yupi tribe. Today, the Amamutsan tribal band, which is comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. We also take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huch Yun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochen Yo speaking Ohlone people. The, success, the, successor, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. It's also vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also that we recognize the Mawekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Land acknowledgements are important for recognizing the history of stolen lands and the presence of indigenous peoples and their enduring relationship to their traditional homelands. Now I would like to share a couple of details about this afternoon's event. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of each panel segment. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box below at any time. You can, access, uh, you can access the closed captioning feature available on Zoom by clicking the CC box on your screen and selecting show subtitle. Please note that this event is being recorded. Thank you to the New Venture Fund Public Interest Technology University Network for funding the work that has resulted in this afternoon's digital security webinar. We invite you to learn more about our centers by clicking on the links in the chat. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the first panel, Professor Alexa Koenig, who will introduce our panelists. Alexa Koenig is executive director of UC Berkeley's Human Rights Center, co-founder of UC Berkeley's Investigations Lab, a lecturer in the schools of law and journalism, and a driving force behind the Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations. Her recent books include Digital Witness and the forthcoming book called Graphic, Trauma and Meaning in Our Online Lives, forthcoming in 2023. Take it away, Alexa. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Dr. Falcone and to the entire team at UC Santa Cruz for partnering with our team here at UC Berkeley on today's events. I'm looking very forward to this conversation, which will focus on the concept of holistic security. We have three incredible panelists in this particular segment, 
Steve Trush of West County Labs, Rachel Cornejo of Deloitte, and Perle Wezigwe of TikTok. Each panelist will provide a few opening remarks and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So please do contribute any questions or thoughts you might have to the Q&A function. Each, um, if you'd like to ask a question, do so in the Q&A box. And with that, I, it's my tremendous privilege to introduce Steve Trush. So welcome to Steve. Steve is director of West County Labs and an expert in holistic security and open source research, supporting government, academia, and the nonprofit world. Steve was one of the founding directors of UC Berkeley's Citizen Clinic, the world's first public interest cybersecurity clinic to protect civil society from digital oppression. With that, I hand it over to you, Steve. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I have a couple slides I want to share. Um, essentially, what I want to do is just set up a definition of what holistic security is um, and how it's important in not just human rights work, but across many industries. Uh, several years ago, uh, when I was teaching Berkeley students how to protect targeted activist groups, my colleagues and I wanted to comprehensively address the threats facing those activists we were working with, as well as the students that would be exposed to traumatic subject matter and survivors of violence, physical, racial, and sexual. And actually, uh, Dr. Alexa Koenig uh, had recently wrestled with a similar problem with her investigations lab at the Human Rights Center and recommended that we use a holistic security approach in our own clinic that would stress psychosocial well-being and resiliency as strongly as we knew that we focus on digital and operational security. So here's a simple definition um, that I have on the slide from, comes from Tactical Tech. Uh, they're a Berlin-based uh, activist group that has published the Holistic Security Manual uh, back in 2016. Uh, they say holistic security integrates digital security, psychosocial well-being, and operational security processes and it really highlights their interrelatedness rather than looking at them in, in separate boxes. It's really centered on well being. That's the key part that we miss by just focusing on the digital or, or physical security. And that well being, it, it's based in our physical and emotional healthiness and sustaining ourselves to do the work that we believe in. Uh, a holistic security practitioner that understands that. Well-being, it's, it's a highly subjective thing um, and it's influenced by our identities, our communities, um, our belief systems, the context we're in, the mission of our organizations and everything that we've experienced to this point. And the, the convergence um, of these concepts is, is not a new thing. Um, it's, but it's a more realistic and accurate depiction of the threats that we face. Um, we need to move past the idea that one can separate their digital and real lives, uh, that when someone is being abused online, that is, they can simply turn off their computer and not worry about the impact. This is never actually the case to be true. Uh, and that myth has especially impacted women and people of color and LGBT communities. Uh, just a couple of examples uh, to show the importance of this concept. Uh, we frequently see these protections uh, designed for physical safety and that actually place people in greater harm of digital surveillance, such as the case of these GPS enabled panic buttons for journalists uh, are being used in South America, and simply by exploiting a simple technological vulnerability an attacker, an attacker could actually use the button to track and locate the journalists. Um, also, when we are under times of intense emotional stress, such as throughout this pandemic, uh, not only may threats rise more frequently due to that physical separation and the remote reliance on remote work technologies, but also have a lower ability to successfully identify things like phishing emails. Uh, and, and finally, many common threats that we see today, they don't cleanly fall into a cybersecurity threat or a physical threat. When technological systems are being used as designed, but still subject its users or its, their employees to emotionally damaging materials via harassment, uh, disinformation, traumatic content. It's a, undeniably a safety and security issue 
Um, and we see this in the psychological trauma experienced by content moderators, for instance, of, of major platforms. And so uh, just closing, there are three things I wanna share about holistic security. Um, integrated does not mean that uh, focusing on one aspect, you're automatically improving the others. Like with the panic buttons, by adding one protection, you have to consider that is it introducing other vulnerabilities to the other uh, components. Also, this is very subjective. Um, and at least you need to recognize how gender, race, and class identities impact both the frequency and the severity of the threats to members of your organizations. And this includes how you respond to that threat. So I mentioned the impact of COVID on our well being. That impact was not shared equally across all social groups, of course. And things like, you know, similarly, calling 911 or going to HR, that may not be effective or even safe options for everyone in your organization. Finally, it's the right thing to do. Um, ethics is driving this, that we shouldn't also just be protecting our own people, but those that we were advocating for, those that are the focus of our research, those that may use our systems. As, our, as you are designing research protocols, you need to consider not only how the information will be stored, but the psychological impact on your research subjects, or how that new app feature can be used to perpetuate psychological harm, even without an account being hacked. And so um, to protect your own employees, especially those that may be the most vulnerable um, to what the majority has largely ignored, um, but also to protect the beneficiaries and those touched by your work. It really matters to have education programs, you know, based in experiential learning to bring these concepts together. Um, and the students at Dr. Parkon and Dr. Kinney's labs are actively engaging with these concepts on a regular basis. There's still very few places though, uh, to develop these strategies in a controlled and managed environment. And really the activists and journalist communities have largely learned and gained this experience through blood and tears. So to have students from various disciplines develop these skills and bring these experiences um, as new employees in this field or, or whatever field that they're going into, that, it, that has and will continue to have a, a great impact on adopting this perspective. And with that, I'm, I'm honored to have uh, my fellow panelists, Rachel and Perle, to share uh, more on this idea once I figure out how to turn off my... Slides. There we go. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. And um, it's now my privilege to introduce our next speech speaker, Rachel Cornejo. One of the things I most appreciate about Rachel is her a passion for helping individuals and communities understand and actively participate in their own security. She's currently a cyber risk consultant at Deloitte. Previously, she designed security tools for investigative journalists and acted as a security consultant for nonprofits through Citizen Clinic at UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. With that, Rachel, thank you so much for being here, and I turn it over to you. Thank you for that excellent introduction, Alexa, um, and thank you, Steve, for um, that introduction to holistic security. Um, as a former student of Alexa's and Steve's and um, Sylvanas, who greatly benefited from this emphasis on holistic security, I'm kind of here to explain a little more about what that looked like in practice. Um, so during my time at the Human Rights Center, um, I managed a lab team um, that was working on a lot of very intense human rights investigations. Um, in particular, um, we worked on one kind of repeatedly looking at videos of protesters during a revolution in order to verify them. Um, and as a manager, I tried to bring in holistic security and kind of, you know, talk to my team about, okay, when we watch these kinds of videos, we're going to minimize the screen, we're going to not turn on the sound all of the time to minimize the impact to ourselves. Um, with the end goal being that taking those kinds of precautions helps, um, helps um, sort of students to be able to do this kind of work in the long term. Um, we also had a lot of conversations around why are we doing this work? What kind of impact are we having? And that's a holistic security conversation that helps people kind of connect back to the work in the hard moments and be able to do it for the long haul. Um, and something really special from that was that as a manager, I was able to help inspire future generations at the HRC to do the same thing, right? I managed um, a woman who went out to manage her own lab team and she said, hey, Rachel, 
I showed the holistic security triangle um, or Venn diagram to my students and they're going to take it forward as well. So I really appreciate the work that both RCA and the HRC are doing kind of bring this forward um, and kind of the domino effect that that has. Um, secondly, I used um, some of the holistic security knowledge um, and research put forward by Alexa um, in the study, Safe Reviewing, a study of secondary trauma mitigation techniques and open source investigations. Um, Perla A and I kind of put a lot of that together um, and founded a um, sort of activism, I guess, founded a nonprofit that um, provided digital security resources, holistic security resources um, during the George Floyd protests and during the uprisings in Nigeria that occurred um, soon after the pandemic started. Um, and our goal there was to kind of spread social media resiliency tips and help the wider community understand that holistic security is important, right? So we encouraged, um, our goal was to encourage activism um, by encouraging people to have a um, intentional relationship with sensitive content, right? So part of practicing holistic security is understanding when you have capacity to look at that content and when you don't. Um, and so we put out some different toolkits that had social media resiliency tips, such as, you know, be intentional with the time that you set out for consuming sensitive content. Don't look at it late at night. Don't look at it in your room. Um, change your settings so that you're only getting notifications at certain times. Um, we also put together a list of therapists, many of which were free and women of color centric, um, and a list of intersectional mental health resources. And all of these are different resources and tips um, and actions people can take to kind of maintain holistic security. Um, you know, and why did we do all of this? We did this to get people to think about, you know, how am I protecting myself in order to be able to do this kind of human rights work in, able to, in order to be able to do this kind of activism and investigation for the long haul. Um, as for kind of a more professional setting, I work in cybersecurity. Um, I've given presentations on the importance of holistic security to cybersecurity workers um, and people who, you know, people, professionals across cybersecurity, human rights, and crisis response who all want to keep people safe, but often at the expense of their own mental health. And, you know, I know what that looks like. I fall into that trap. Um, I think it's really important to kind of think about holistic security and preach this so that on days when you aren't thinking about your own holistic security, others can kind of catch you and be like, hey, you know, what are you doing to protect your own mental health as you're doing this work? Um, how can you make it sustainable for the long haul? Um, and my experience um, at the lab has kind of shown me that, you know, we need to be having more of these conversations with our managers. We need to be encouraging others who will become managers later um, to take these ideas forward. Um, yeah, so I'm very thankful to everyone here for giving me a grounding in holistic security that I have taken forward into the workplace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I, we next have with us Perle Wezegwe. It's always a pleasure to learn from and hear from Perle. She's a Nigerian lawyer who obtained her LLB from the prestigious University of Lagos and obtained her master's in international human rights law from UC Berkeley. Her interests are in human rights and technology, which led her to her current role as a policy manager Africa at TikTok. Her role entails creating inclusive policies that foster free expression amongst users in 47 countries. Her area of expertise includes policy development, responsible innovation, policy enforcement, and trust and safety. Perle, thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Alexa. It's so good to see you. Um, and thank you, Steve and Rachel, uh, for be beginning the conversation. Um, just as Rachel mentioned earlier, um, during my time at UC Berkeley, I had the privilege of working on open source investigation. And um, during that time, we would have to investigate um, different platforms like Facebook, Twitter, to look out for either misinformation or graphic content that would help in a particular um, you know, crime that had happened you know, in the situation. And then during the time of the pandemic, a lot of you know, things had happened. There was a Black Lives Matter movement. There were crises in Nigeria, and a lot of people resorted to using their phones, social media um, to communicate or to spread information. But with that, also just kind of brought about, you know, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma. And that means when somebody is basically 
feeling emotions um, from somebody else, somebody. So if they've seen someone who had hurt themselves in a video, um, the person who watched that video ends up being impacted just because they had you know, witnessed violence online. Um, and just because of that, a lot of people, you know, there were reports of just mental health, you know, going on a decline. And so myself, Rachel, Lily, um, we decided to create a website, just kind of like accumulating these various resources that we had learned at UC Berkeley, um, just had Rachel had mentioned in the earlier presentation. And we started Rated R. So Rated R, even though it means a movie rating, it actually stands for like three different R's, which was, you know, resilience, revolution and <clears throat> excuse me so basically um resistance revolution and resilience that was what rated r stand m stood for and we wanted to use this project to speak out to young people especially just like myself who use social media as their way of activism and then we had different prompts basically telling them okay if you were on your phone right now these are things that you can do to protect your well-being and an example would be just like, if you're watching a horrific video, do you have to watch it completely? Um, is it not better if you just read the news instead? Or an example is basically, you know, not watching a horrific, a horrific video while you're on your bed. And then we also had prompts just to check in on people because unfortunately the pandemic had made us feel very isolated in our homes, in our schools and in different places. And so these prompts were, self-care prompts to remind people to get out of their comfort zone, to get out, to even shower, to play music. So this website, you know, we definitely took our time to pull in different resources, self-care resources, therapists, and so many others. And more importantly, we also had events, um, monthly check-ins with um, women of color, just basically to check in and see, okay, how are you doing? How are you coping in this pandemic? And how are you coping in this revolution? Um, it's it is sad to see that like there's still so many you know crazy events happening around the world with Russia um, things that are going on in Ukraine and so many other um, you know violent tragedies going on in around the world and so the need to continue digital activism still exists we still need to speak out online but more importantly we still have to protect our mind because the truth is the moment we you know the moment we grow tired revolution dies and so it is very important that we keep up this holistic security that this conversation is about and just as steve had mentioned you know the psychosocial well-being is definitely at the core front of all the investigations that we do and even our work at tiktok this is something that we put into place just making sure that we do have well-beings because we do watch videos on tiktok we do see violent content on these platforms and it's definitely our responsibility to take care of our well-being. And so these tips that I learned from UC Berkeley have definitely carried on into my work, making sure that I'm still resilient every day to continue um, the job of digital activism. Thank you so much. Thank you, Perlay. And now if I can invite Steve and Rachel to join us. Um, and I will look for questions in the Q&A, but as we're waiting for those, one that I'd like to start all of you off with um, I'm often surprised when we train professional investigators, whether they're war crime investigators or investigative reporters, at how foreign this concept of holistic security actually is. So most of them are familiar with the concept of physical security and have had some degree of training in it and have different protocols that we have in place. That one's the most familiar. The digital security piece, they're often aware that it's important, but they're often not aware of just how many digital traces that they leave when they start to do investigations online and how information is monitored and tracked. Even when we've trained US congressional staffers, that was an area that I think was very eye-opening. And then the third is the psychosocial piece. So one thing we often get, get as a response is actually unlike the other two, just wholesale pushback. Like I'm a hardened war crime investigator or an investigator re reporter who's been doing this work for decades. I don't need that stuff because I'm tough and can handle it. I'm curious from the three of you, if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see happen next to disseminate broader awareness of the importance of really thinking about security through a holistic lens. And with that, maybe we can just um, go start with Steve since you kicked us off initially. Yeah, uh, th that's a great question because that's uh, a lot of what I try to introduce when I'm working uh, with the organizations that I support. And really the difference I see in uh, 
kind of a success of where the holistic approach is adopted comes from leadership and it comes from it, there being buy-in from the top. So having um, you know employers understand that this is important and even if they don't quite understand how um, they, they can you know reach out to to people who are experts in it. But it really, you need to have that that thought of like yeah, this is something we need to set aside time for training. Um, we need to set aside budget for uh, improving our systems. Um, and if they don't do that, it can't just be a lip service. And that's where I see what the main difference and the thing I most, most ask for. Thank you. Rachel or Perle, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I definitely think that um, we, I think whenever someone is getting into this industry, like it's necessary to have onboarding that specifically calls out these type of trainings. Um, so just, you know, we're talking about this is definitely something that needs to be ingrained in a lot of companies, organizations, like what does your onboarding, you know, have to say about, you know, psychosocial security? Like we've handled the physical, we've handled how to protect your devices, but a lot of companies just haven't gotten there yet when it comes to psychosocial, um, like, you know, first of all, because it feels like it's an afterthought. So still, it was still, we still have a long way to go to have like onboarding materials. Um, so as you're coming in as a new employee into like the journalistic, you know, space or the security space, what are your onboarding materials looking like when it comes to these kind of conversations? So maybe that could be a step forward. So I know that that is like the core front of what the company cares about. They care about your resilience, they care about your mental state. Wonderful, thank you. And Rachel, just in the last minute that we have, um, maybe I can ask you a little bit about what you would recommend for people who wanna dive in more deeply to better understanding holistic security or getting up to speed. Are there any tools or tips or tricks that you would wanna share? I mean, I think that the Rage of Resilient website is a great place to start. Um, I mean, um, we kind of like put together a lot of, um, there's kind of an academic resources section that has a lot of the work that um, you see Berkeley has done, the Human Rights Center and others, um, and then we put together some of our own. Um, so I think that that is kind of a starting point. Um, and we have kind of some, some um, toolkits for sort of your specific engagement with graphic content, but also sort of mental health more generally. Um, yeah. And I think if I were to leave you with one tip or trick, I would say be intentional with your time, right? That you're spending on some of these things, right? Set aside time to delve into the news and delve into, you know, kind of stressful things and then set aside time to be productive and take action and then set aside time to decompress. I think it all comes down to that. Um, so if I could leave you with one kind of tip to improve your day-to-day -day resiliency, that's what it would be. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you to all of our panelists in this first session. We really appreciate hearing from and learning from all of you. Um, with that, I'd like to now introduce our next moderator, Sophia Lisette Kuhner of the Human Rights Center here at UC Berkeley. She is the lab coordinator for the Human Rights Center, and she will lead the next conversation on inspiring industry change. Um, Sophia studied critical race and ethnic studies and sociology with an intensive concentration in global information and social enterprise studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. In her role as lab coordinator, Sophia supports undergraduate and graduate students in managing open source investigations all over the world. Thank you, Sophia, for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Lexa. Um, this next segment is about the need for industry change, and we have two panelists to engage um, in this conversation with us. Um, Karen Go from Salesforce and Lee Honeywell from Tall Poppy. Um, each panelist will provide opening remarks and we'll use the rest of our time for Q&A. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the Q&A box um, and we'll begin with Karen Go. Raised in Singapore, Karen moved to California to pursue her undergraduate studies at UC Berkeley, where she graduated with a computer science degree and a human rights minor. She now works as a software engineer at Salesforce and volunteers with Code Nation, teaching web development and mentoring high school students from underrepresented and underserved communities. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here today and share my experiences with all of you. 
while I did choose to go to big tech after graduating, uh, I think there's still a lot that can be paralleled between the tech industry and the human rights space or whatever industry, other industry you might be thinking about in terms of how we can think about inspiring industry change. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of systemic change to be done, but at the same time, I think there's really a lot that we can also do on a personal level, um, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we dive into the Q&A. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your questions, and as someone who's also pretty early into their uh, career, I won't claim to always have the right answer, but I'm happy to share my thoughts and perspectives. Thanks, Karen. Um, next, I'll introduce Lee Honeywell. Lee is the co-founder and CEO of Tall Poppy, where she helps companies protect their employees from online harassment. She was previously a technology fellow at the ACLU and also worked at Slack, Salesforce.com, Microsoft, and Symantec. Lee has a BSc from the University of Toronto. There we go. Hey folks, so glad to be able to speak with you all today. Um, I've been really fortunate to have the chance to work in different parts of the tech industry, small businesses, huge companies, startups and nonprofits. Um, I've had a chance to work directly at the intersection of tech issues and social justice, um, whether that was during my time at the ACLU or in my current role running a company where we're building tools to help keep people safe from online harassment, which as you might imagine, disproportionately affects people who are marginalized in some ways. Um, I've also worked at the meta issues of inclusion within the tech industry itself. Um, I think of this as having two parts, the sort of pipeline of making sure that underrepresented people have an equal opportunity to pursue careers in tech in the first place, but also the question of retention, making sure that those of us who do start working in tech get to stay here and advance in our careers. So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Lee. Um, I'd like to invite both Lee and Karen back to this room. Um, and so we're happy to move into the Q&A portion right now. Um, so please throw any of your questions um, in that box. But um, maybe I can start out with a question. Um, because I work with undergraduates all day long and graduation is approaching for everyone in May, um, you know, career pathways and job searching is top of mind right now. Um, and so I would say, what are what are important questions um, to ask in the interview process um, to make sure a workplace is inclusive and has a good culture fit? I can start with a couple of things. Um, I think there are there are actually a bunch of questions that one should ask even before the interview process starts. Does the organization publish, uh, particularly for larger organizations, do they publish diversity related demographics about the organization? How does that relate? Um, how do those demographics compare to the industry at large? Is it you look at those numbers and you're like, oh, yikes, this has half of the industry average of uh, women in in their engineering department. Is that a place that I as a woman actually want to go? Um, so there's this, this sort of like, what is the, the public data, the, the open source intelligence that you can gain about the um, even what, what you can find out externally about an organization. And then from there, going into an interview process, if it does pass that sort of sniff test, um, during the interview process, what do the people, you know, what are the demographics of the people that you're interviewing, the people on your loop? Um, and then when you have those conversations with an interviewer, uh, talking to them about what are the internal practices of the organization in terms of, again, that advancement piece. It's one, lots of lots and lots of organizations talk the talk in terms of, oh yeah, we want more women, we want more people of color, we're a great place for people with disabilities to work, except that when you actually scratch the surface, they're happy to get those people in the door and then they don't necessarily succeed, so yeah. Yeah, I think what I would add to that is just to say, remember while they're interviewing you, it's also like a chance for you to interview them. and. I think that's really easy to forget, but this is somewhere you're theoretically going to spend a minimum of 40 hours a week. So you should really use that interview as a chance to ask all the questions you want to ask um, about somewhere you're going to spend that much time. Um, and yeah, just really looking at the demographics of your panel, like Lee was saying, and 
just really asking outright, I think, and making sure to ask all of your panel even, because people will have different responses, um, especially a manager compared to an individual contributor. So just ask the questions. Um, thank you both. And kind of to follow up on that, um, what do you think tech companies should do then to be proactive about retaining underrepresented talent? I think the, the biggest, or actually, sorry, Karen, did you want to say something? No, you go ahead. Yeah, the biggest thing for me in terms of the, the really quantitative stuff that organizations need to be paying attention to um, is promotion velocity. Are we promoting as an organization, are we promoting underrepresented people at the same velocity um, and with the same pay bumps and that kind of thing as people who are not underrepresented? Um, and, and if not, like, where are those sort of fall offs? Um, I, I think there was a, it felt like for the 2010s, there was this whole phenomenon where companies would hire like a ton of women straight out of boot camps. Um, and then they would all sort of stall at the like early senior stage of their careers. I remember during my time at Slack, I was for the entire, I think, first year that I was there, I was the only senior staff woman. Um, and the, and for a while, when I went over to management, there were no senior staff women, and then finally someone got promoted. But um, yeah, I think the like, again, this is something that can come up in the interview process, digging into like, what does what does advancement look like within the organization? Um, and it's one of those tricky things where you have to like couch that question in a particular way. So it doesn't come off that you're like asking about promotions during your interview, but it's more like, how is the organization thinking about inclusion um, in the overall advancement process of the organization. Uh, yeah, definitely plus one to all of that. Um, I think the thing Lee was saying about as you go up, uh, the number of women or sort of any sort of minority tends to drop off. And I've had managers definitely tell me that um, when I've talked to them about things. So I think Definitely look out for that um, during your interview process. Talk about what career growth might look like. Um, you want somewhere that's gonna be transparent about the promotion process, because generally things are more fair, at least in theory. And so some you wanna work somewhere that's transparent about that. Um, and yeah, somewhere that's willing to invest in your career growth and the career you want as well, not the career that they want you to have. I think a lot of women get pushed into management, um, whether they want to or not. And so you wanna be somewhere that's gonna let you grow into whatever you wanna be, whether that is a manager or an engineer. I almost feel like the women who want to get pushed into management don't, and the women who don't wanna get pushed into management do a lot of the time. It's, it can be really, really frustrating. Um, I think often in technical workplaces, people misinterpret like friendliness and people skills for I want to be a manager. And those are, those are not necessarily the same thing. So, yeah. Could you both maybe share a little bit more than in how you, you've seen things change over the years and how, um, you know, companies you've worked at have been more, have practiced an inclusive environment and how that's kind of changed um, over time and both, uh, in like a more holistic manner, but also just like in your everyday interactions. I can start on this one. Uh, so I work at Salesforce and I think one of the big initiatives we've had is the equal pay initiative. And that's sort of one way we've been looking at how to make sure that, you know, there is equal pay and all of those sorts of things. Um, another thing that we started doing last year was anyone who uh, was gonna interview someone had to undergo um, an unconscious bias training. And so I think that was something that was really helpful because I mean, some people knew about it, some people didn't, but just being there in that training and learning how to apply that knowledge into the interview process and really focusing on what we call it core competencies, but basically the actual skills you need to do the job. And so I think interview training has been really important in helping 
our diversity and inclusion efforts. I've been working in tech for coming up on 15 years now. There's actually gray under the, the pink hair. And um, I think the, the two biggest sort of seed changes that I've seen um, around diversity and inclusion, uh, one of them is just this like theoretical understanding of things like unconscious bias, um, just different, like sort of sociological, like a, taking a sociological perspective on workplace inequality, um, and really applying that like rigorous evidence-based lens to like why are there only like a few women CEOs? This seems ridiculous. Like women start more businesses in America than than men do. Like how do how do we end up with this like disproportionate thing at the top? And really like that research coming into coming into the fore in a way that really impacts people's working life in a day-to-day -day way, um, in a way that I don't, I certainly don't remember from like the late 2000s. Um, I think the other thing of it is the industry, the technology industry maturing in general, um, maturing and in, in some ways like professionalizing, um, you, you know, talking about interview training, talking about training for managers, these are things that like people kind of just yoloed it 15 years ago that like, oh, you're okay, you're a manager now, you're the most senior technologist, you you are now responsible for a bunch of people. That seemed like a thing you could just hand wave away versus like, oh, maybe we should actually teach you how to be a manager before making you responsible for other people's careers. Like, huh, shocking, good idea there. Um, and it, like I think that those those both um really impact the experience of underrepresented people in organizations. Because the flip side of that like YOLO management style is that the crappy management disproportionately impacts people who are marginalized in some way. If your manager is a clown and you're dealing with like interpersonal issues because your colleague is like engaging in pregnancy discrimination against you, like that clown manager isn't going to have the tools to like properly handle that situation. Whereas if they've been equipped with the tools to like be a good manager and know how they need to advocate for their employees, they're going to do a better job dealing with those tricky interpersonal issues um, than someone who's like just manager because they were there the longest. So it's certainly not like a universal thing that people are getting in this training, um, but I think it is happening more today than it was early in my career, which feels like a positive shift. Um, thanks so much, y'all. Um, and I think in this last minute, if we can just end with just a small piece of advice for, um, you know, undergraduates entering the workforce um, as like an underrepresented individual, um, what advice can you give to those students? Two things come to mind from my early career experiences. One, it's so essential to have a posse like a set of peers that you can, both peers and people that are like a little further ahead of you in your in their careers, so that you can be like, hey, this thing happened at work, is this normal, is this weird? And just have that sort of gut check. Um, having that posse, having those peers, incredibly important. Um, the other thing is like, don't stay too long. If things are crappy, bounce. Like we live in the hottest technology hiring market in history, um, there's, you know, no reason to stay if you're being mistreated with the with the asterisk of sometimes you have to stay because of things like visas i've been there it sucks i resonate with so much of what lee just said um, yeah finding a squad a posse whatever you want to call it but a group of people you can go to with your work problems and get validation from get support that's really helpful and then i think the other thing i would say is either find someone who will advocate for you or learn to advocate for yourself because unfortunately like as a minority as a woman people need to just more explicitly hear that you're doing the same work as someone else um, it's really unfortunate but it's sort of just something we have to do and hopefully that changes but yeah find someone who will advocate for you whether that's yourself or someone else on your team i think for that advocacy piece one of the most like mind blown kind of things that I got early in my career was learning about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And there's a bunch of research that shows that women in particular are over mentored and under sponsored. Tons of people giving you advice. There are fewer people that are like actually sticking their neck out for you and advocating for you. And so it's important to cultivate the latter, you know, 
get as much advice as you need, but but don't overdo it on the advice. Thank you both. Um, that was super helpful. And um, just thanks for saying your shot, thoughts on um, inspiring this industry change. And I know it, it definitely means a lot to me and the students that um, we work with. Um, and, and next, I'd like to uh, well, welcome back Dr. Silvana Falcone um, of UC Santa Cruz, who will facilitate the final set of conversations on managing security risks and well being online. Uh, Dr. Silvana M. Falcone is an associate professor at the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies, uh, the director of the Research Center for, Ameri for the Americas, and founder and director of the Human Rights Investigations Lab at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thank you so much to all of the panelists um, who've been with us this afternoon. Um, this closing segment will be in two parts. In the first part, we are going to hear from Abir Gatas of Human Rights Watch. And in the second part, we're going to hear from resiliency expert and trainer, Nikita Gupta, along with UC Santa Cruz students, Monica Mikkel and Sydney Elliott. But we're gonna first begin with Abir Gatas of Human Rights Watch. Abir is the Associate Director for Information at Human Rights Watch. She provides strategic and operational oversight for managing information security risks that Human Rights Watch staff face in their work. Abir also founded Haman Radio, a feminist participatory radio launched from Berlin, where she is based, although I think she's, based, she's zooming in now from Qatar. So um, welcome, Abir. Thank you so much for being here. If you could just start us off with a little bit more about your work, um, and some of the challenges you see, and then we'll engage in Q and A. Yeah, of course. Um, hi, Sabani. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, first, I'm the director of um, information security. It's freshly recent, but yay! Let's celebrate women in security. Um, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's such great. It's really great to hear um, everybody that has been uh, talking before me. Um, very inspirational. Um, so being the director of information security for Human Rights Watch is, I want to say, a very exciting job, very demanding job. Um, we work uh, mostly with our researchers um, that cover human rights violation across the globe. Uh, we work with in different um, scenarios and threat landscape. We make sure kind of like the work, our approach to work is we want to make sure that you are safe, the people that you work with are safe, the information that you deal with is safe, and the organization as a whole is safe. Um, which kind of like makes me almost, when I start by this, I always think about like the security cultures that when I started working in security, I didn't really kind of experience. Um, it's not a surprise, but it's a very kind of like male dominant uh, field. And um, I, al I always felt that compassion and kind of like a holistic approach was missing from this. And this is something that I and our team at Human Rights Watch try to kind of uh, bring in together. Um, having compassion and in the way that we do, in the way we approach security risk, in the way we talk with our staff around security risk, in the way we assess uh, the situation that they live in is something that I think um, makes the work, makes, yeah, makes how we do security better. Um, there's a big aspect of care work that comes in security that's often disregarded or not talked about. Um, and that it, I think it should be front and center in the sense of policies and procedures and tools and configurations are very, very important, but also the human factor is also very, very important. Um, we work with our researchers and our researchers work with other investigators and human rights researchers in different scenarios and different threat um, landscape. And it is very, it's not very, um, yeah, there's not one solution or like one tick box or one checklist that will make you more secure or more safe on how to do things. So kind of 
we always need to kind of like be creative in how we approach security and how we try to mitigate, try to explain risks and try to kind of also educate, like we take every opportunity as a kind of like an educational opportunity. Um, in addition, uh, yeah, mitigate. I wanted to say something. Sorry, it's a bit late here. So yeah, um, <laughs> I was supposed to join in from Berlin, but I had a family emergency at the last moment. So now I'm not in Berlin. Anyway, um, going back to kind of like um, the values. So if I just want to talk briefly about the values of, for example, how I practice security. I mentioned compassion. I want to talk about creativity because like our adversaries are only getting better at what they do. They have way more resources. They have way more people. Um, they have more money, basically. So we need to be more creative in the ways we prepare us, our organizations, our staff, our partner organization, and how to, first of all, detect kind of like assess risks and then respond and mitigate to it. Um, another kind of element or like another core value that we have and we try to bring into the way we do work is consistency and while it is kind of like implemented and when you have technical configuration it cascades and then you have consistency with a human factor consistency is often not there um, so here comes kind of like education and the fact that there is an opportunity to leave things and also humans better than you found them in the sense of let's learn something new about security about how you do security because at the end of the day um they're the one implementing everything and they're the one um that are also suffering from the consequences when things go wrong um yeah i think that's my quick introduction that i great hope I <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Abir, and congratulations on your um, promotion to director. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit, you talked about uh, adversaries of, you know, we needing to be sort of be flexible in responding to adversarial threats. So could you talk about maybe what you've been seeing in the last five to 10 years in terms of perhaps the speed in which uh, the threats are coming uh, to human rights digital investigators, to your team there at Human Rights Watch. Um, if you could talk a little bit about maybe the speed of uh, the threats and the pace in which they come. Yeah, I mean, thank you. As I said, like the threat landscape, uh, landscape is always evolving. The adversaries, they have way more resources, way more money, um, time, um, and often, human rights, whether uh, investigators or researchers, whether they belong to an organization or to a big organization or a small organization, or they volunteer and do all the investigative work they do online, they often do, I want to see multiple other things alongside. Um, so basically the approach is, how can we reduce, first of all, our attack surface and how basically whether you are a person or an organization, and then how you can make it hard and very expensive for those who want to attack you, compromise you, um, or target you. If you want to talk about the speed, it is very, very quick. Like we are, I don't know, if, if you think about, I don't know, 10 years back, attacks were a bit, I mean, the technology was simpler, right? So attacks were a bit simpler. Um, security controls were also simpler. But right now, given the huge amount of tools that are being created, the huge amount of data that is being shared, whether shared by us as users or being massively collected and then aggregated and then analyzed and then shared again in another format, um, your or what we call in the security kind of your attack vector or like is is can target everything right so whether you're a professional or not uh, it, it can be for your your attack can come after your organization can come after your um, personal email can come after your family i mean it has changed completely and i want to say we're often catching up right um but one interesting thing to notice is 
this difference from like five years till now that there's the general awareness of the huge impact that human rights investigator and researchers can have when they use technology and public data for the work has greatly increased. And with this increase, like with this increase of impact comes um, an increase in becoming more and more a target, whether by government, whether by um, semi-state actors, whether just by people who just wanna have fun and mess with other people who are, I don't know, gathering information, sharing data online, exposing uh, violations. So more and more you see human rights investigators being mindful of their not only um, digital security, but also physical security. They're also being more mindful about the data they collect, but also about the mindful the data they share online about themselves. Um, the, 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 the data they're analyzed, the data they're preserving, where is it? going, how are they preserving it, who has access to it. And another thing that also changed over the past couple of years is uh, them being very mindful about the tools that are being used. So everything is changing, right? All these platforms, sometimes they're easy um, or like accessed easily, data is exfiltrated easily, and sometimes not. So you have these tools um, popping up left and right, and then um, human rights investigators start asking these questions is like, who's behind these tools? Who actually knows who am I investigating? If I go and search something or I gonna go and like dump my data somewhere, who does, who have access to it and what are they gonna do with it? So all of these considerations, five years ago, we didn't, I mean, I don't wanna say we didn't really, really have them, but they weren't as important. Um, in, in how we do day-to-day -day business or how we talk to uh, people who do uh, human rights investigation. Another thing is um, the kind of like the psychosocial security of, of, uh, of this role of being a human rights um, investigator or researchers. Again, the, it all comes back to the data and to the how, how much people have access and people are sharing. But so from the other end, we're collecting and we're seeing all of this information. And this is also one of the aspects that is not covered a lot, but I think um, if you practice a holistic approach to security, whether it's information or physical or operation, um, kind of like the psychosocial aspect of things is very, very important. Um, these investigators and our researchers, they work with distressing imagery all day long, right? And but what changed is that there is an increased awareness of how important it is to okay, how can I deal with working with distressing content? What are the um, strategies that I need to implement, or what are the strategies that I need to share with other people um, when dealing with distressing content? Um, and all of that combined, the fact that you are conducting. Um, um, investigational research puts you front and center of becoming a target. Um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of diligence and you only have to like mess up once to not have things point back at you. And while there's a lot of investigators who have a public persona, they, they're out there, they say they do what they do, there's a big bunch of them that don't, um, that try as much as possible to separate their work from their private life for many, many, many reasons. So yeah, things have changed in the past five to 10 years and I'm just guessing it will change even more. I don't know if it's to the better though. So you will be very busy in your role as yes, director. So. <laughs> Another question I had uh, for you and uh, we talked about this before is digital security threats are not experienced the same way based on immigration status, gender, race, ethnicity. Could you talk a little bit about how do you assess the different types of threat based on social identity? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I mean, and I would like to answer it, or I'd like to look at it through kind of like a multi-layered approach. So just the security threats or any security threat for that matter doesn't impact folks the same way. Let's start from this point. And this is the first layer. Another layer is like, 
If we want to look at our online, our online behavior as internet users, simple, pure internet users, um, this online behavior is shaped by many, many factors. Some of these factors are gender identity, gender expression, our ethnicity, where we come from, the language we use, our sexual orientation, the things we like to do, the things we don't like to do. So kind of, and, and, and many other identity markers, whether we like it or not, all of this shape how we use the internet and how we interact with it, whether for work purposes or personal, personal kind of like in our personal um, stuff. And as a result, the digital threats can diff differently impact people based on these uh, factors that I just mentioned. Um, so, and if I just want to now focus on, from everything you've mentioned, if I want to focus on the gender aspect for a second, um, we know that like online gender dynamics, they, they're, a, they're a mirror, right? They reinforce what happens offline. They, they reinforce and sometimes even amplify social, economic, and um, other power dynamics, political structures in the offline world. So we need to consider when we're looking at this, like the access, the limitation, the power structure. And here, when we think about digital threats or attacks, it doesn't simply end online, right? Um, having um, women or like a female identifying investigator dogs, it's not going to stop there um, sometimes, right? It might lead to death threat. It might lead to physical attacks. So now if you, all of that, and now you add the layer of being a human rights uh, researcher, you may, you will get many, many factors to consider. Again, whether you're working alone or whether you're part of an organization. And I'm just gonna like quickly break it down kind of like from a, um, yeah, how do, how do we assess this? So we're gonna say, okay, if you're being targeted and you're all the above, your organization is way more secure than your, um, for example, if you work for an organization, the org security is getting more and more secure, right? This means that the threats and attacks will actually shift to targeting your personal life, to targeting your non-personal account. Um, if the attacker wants to discredit your work, um, you have disinformation, you have misinformation, you have creation of, I don't know, synthetic uh, media, spreading rumors on social, pla social media platforms. Again, depending where you work, where you come from, how you present, all of this can have horrible, devastating um, effects. Again, if your attacker is actually, um, I don't know, from the same country or where you are, then other than online surveillance, you might be monitored, um, you might be tracked physically, um, you might be harassed. So. And the escalation can lead to eventually, it's not just about you, right? It's about the circle around you. It won't stop there. It will be with your family, whether it's because they have information about you because of anything that you, I don't know, anything that belongs to you can be used against you or just simply by attacking them, doxing them, harassing them, um, pretending to, I don't know, Kind of just causing simple stress uh, to to your family. So all of this, it's, it's not just you're a human rights researcher doing something online and then you switch off. Like I wish it was that, but it's often not. So we just have about another minute left, and I wondered if you could perhaps give um, a tip or a piece of advice that all of us could be doing, whether or not we're a human rights investigator, that we should be doing to ensure um, our, our holistic security? I mean, um, I'll give quick tips because <laughs> it's, it's very, very hard to just tell you to do one thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know, sometimes like you have cyber war looming on us and then be like, Oh, please don't you reuse your password. Actually, yes, please do not reuse your passwords. Um, so by order of what I like, um, please use a password manager. Having a password manager is better than, having a password manager even if it was like this is better than having nothing. Do not reuse your password. Turn on multi-factor authentication on all your online accounts. It's an extra layer of protection that really, really does the trick. Um, Think about your data. Think about 
where is it? Who has access to it? And then ask, does it have to be there? And do they have to have access to it? And often, more often than not, the answer is no. And when the answer is no, and you're really, really convinced, just take it down. Try as much as possible to take it down. And then after you've done all of this, think about, okay, what about the data that I want to keep? Good. Where should you keep it? And then think about, if you keep it somewhere, who will have access to it? And will they have access to it? And then it's kind of like this kind of a circle that basically, if you do these five steps of like password manager, don't use password, use unique passwords, basically, multi-factor authentication, backup stuff, or just delete stuff if you don't need them. I think we reduce a lot, we eliminate a lot of unnecessary um, uh, risks, basically, because not everybody is a target, right? Not everybody is going to be targeted by a million dollar malware or um, not, not everybody is, but everybody shares a lot of information and everybody's data is going to be found in a leak somewhere that might be used by whether it's an actual threat actor or just some kind of like hacker sitting somewhere having fun because it's actually less risky to steal this kind of data than to break in somewhere and steal it. So yeah, um, I think that's that, that would be my tips um, for them. Well, thank you so much, Abir, for being with us um, your evening, our afternoon. Appreciate Thanks you, so much you um, zooming in from, from Guitar. So in our, so last, um, in our last bit, I'd like to invite Nikita Gupta, Monica Mikhail, and Sydney Elliott. Um, they will be part of our final conversation. Um, Nikita Gupta specializes in transforming trauma through healing and resiliency in educational, as well as in public and private settings. She is especially committed to working with and helping professionals, activists, and educators in caring for themselves while caring for others. Monica Mikhail is a PhD candidate in anthropology and a graduate student researcher in the Human Rights Investigations Lab at UC Santa Cruz. And Sydney Elliott is a fourth year politics major at UC Santa Cruz and has been a researcher in the Human Rights Investigations Lab for three years. So Nikita, we're gonna go ahead and begin with you. If you could start our conversation by um, talking to us about the importance of being intentional about um, uh, you know, the work that you are doing and cultivating um, in, your, um, in your work in your, as, as a resiliency expert. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Falcone. And thanks to all the amazing panelists here. And thanks to everybody who's doing such incredible work um, for the benefit of our humanity. And so when we think about human rights work, it wouldn't be possible without you without your heart, without your body, without your mind, and without your labor. So this is so important for us to keep at the forefront of our efforts as helpers, because without you, we couldn't continue the work. And so many of our panelists have already spoken to this core, um, core uh, truth that we often don't give enough credit to our bodies for showing up and organizing in these spaces to take the effort uh, to do the work that we're doing. So when we think about uh, when we think about it, helpers across professional fields who are exposed to trauma and violence daily are at risk of adverse health effects from such exposure without even realizing it. In the way that we can watch a movie at the theater and we can feel the emotions of the characters on the screen, we may notice our heart racing or tears forming or excitement building. Um, the trauma that we see in our work has similar psycho physiological effects in our bodies. And this manifests specifically in our thoughts, our emotions, and our physical sensations. And then as that gets internalized and experienced, it comes out in the form of our behaviors. And so with repeated trauma exposure, we're constantly reminded that the world can be a very dark place. It can shift our outlook on the possibilities for goodness in our life and make us forget what joy feels like and leave us disconnected from our purpose and lead to you know, career burnout and so on. And in stressful and high paced work environments that are dealing with very urgent matters, we can easily become tired and make choices that impact our own security and our job performance. And so in spite of these challenges, the good news is that we are resilient by nature and by the design of our body. 
and that there are simple strategies that we can implement to mitigate the effects of trauma exposure by tapping into the brilliance of how our body is designed. So our body is designed with an intricate nervous system that reacts and responds to life in every moment. Um, it's our nervous system that mobilizes us into states of reaction, protection, and defense for ourselves and our communities. And it's our nervous system that creates states of pleasant engagement and ease when we're relaxed. And so when we work directly with our nervous system, we can experience healing and replenishment and help to discharge the emotional residue and the mental challenge that are part of uh, human rights work. And um, we can do it together by building infrastructures for restoration in our professional spheres. And I think that's what is really crucial is that we do it together because oftentimes we have, to, you know, this work may not be able to leave our professional spaces during, during, due to confidentiality. We may not wanna bring it home to our loved ones and our loved ones may not even know how to support us or really understand the depth of what it is that we're experiencing. So building in these moments of restoration into our professional spaces can be twofold. It helps us to self care and work with our body to promote an immediate shift in our well being so we can feel more grounded and more present. And then also we can work on a community level where we work with one another to enhance our sense of belonging and reduce the isolation that we can often feel in this work. And so, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Professor Falcone and, um, and, and the team, Sydney and Monica, for the last six months on developing a toolkit for resilience that is such a wonderful complement to some of the other toolkits that our um, presenters have shared um, uh, previous to this one. And so this one centers on actual strategies for our nervous system that we can do to restore. And, and they're gentle practices that honor where we're at, honor what we are in our uh, honor what we're holding in our bodies. And um, it, they, the toolkit centers on restoration of our vitality and works specifically with our breath, our mindset, and deepening our connection to our well being. And the practices that we, uh, you know, we're going to talk about later, they include grounding, reflection, and community care. And in the context of this toolkit, we have four units in the toolkit with uh, various activities. And I'll just share briefly uh, the topics of the toolkit, and then um, my team will take over and, and share some more in-depth information. We have four units in the toolkit. Um, unit one is on reducing secondary trauma through grounding practices. Unit two is self-soothing to ease your nervous system. Unit three is honoring your purpose and releasing excess urgency in the body. And I think we can all relate to what that feels like. Fast thoughts, maybe a racing heart, a little uh, unease in our stomach. Um, and then unit four, alleviating isolation and fostering community care. So the idea here is that we want to create a language for this work so that it can become normalized as part of our professional role, that this should be the number one item on your job description in a recruitment flyer is that you have to practice self and community care. And you know, so we're going to now show um, some of the module, one of the modules from the toolkit, and the entire toolkit will be fully available uh, starting on April 15th. Thank you so much, Nikita. Um, and the chat in the in the chat function will be the link to the toolkit. You do not need a Canvas account in order to access it. It will be publicly available for everyone. So we encourage you to please uh, use this, share it. Um, we worked hard on it and we're really, um, we're really proud of it. And so Sydney's going to start us off by talking about the first uh, toolkit. And I'm just kind of, I'm just showing you here on, so that you can see uh, where you can find this information. So when you click on um, the unit one, you'll see the PDF there for you. And you simply click it and you are actually able to download it um, should you want to um, take it with you. So Sydney, if you could start us off um, by talking about uh, the importance of this work, um, your involvement or anything you would like to share. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, as Professor mentioned, I'm a fourth year politics major. I've been a part of the lab for three years now since my second year, uh, which is also the inaugural year of the lab. Um, and I've been working with Nikita on this toolkit um, for the last six months. I think it's really, really important um, for students who are in early career human rights um, to know the importance of resiliency and taking care of themselves 
so that they have the tools to continue the work um, as they move into a career. Thank um, you, Sydney. Can you talk about what we can find in the toolkit? Yeah, so our toolkit involves four educational units, as Nikita mentioned. We also have a glossary at the end of the toolkit um, that defines some of the terms um, within it, because some of the terms are probably new to most people. Um, and then we have facilitator guides at the end of each unit um, that they're about 10 to 20 minutes and people can use that to facilitate exercises for a classroom or your workspace um, or just with a partner or something if you wanna practice some of these tools. Um, and then we also have descriptions of the different activities that we have inside each unit. So these have been really exciting um, to work on and there are a bunch of different ones. So the first one is pausing for restoration. We've actually created um, a SoundCloud that has audio links um, to guided meditations that are all under 10 minutes. So you can just go directly from the toolkit to that SoundCloud um, and take some time to meditate on your own or with a group. We also have a section called Community Voices um, that reflects on wisdom offered by human rights activists. And we reached out to different partners like Bellingcat and the Human Rights Center at Berkeley and others, um, and had each person provide quotes um, for the toolkit. So that as you're going through, if you're feeling a little uninspired or burnt out, you can read those quotes and reignite your passion for human rights. Um, we also have a section for affirmations. Um, me and Monica created these with the help of other UCSC students. Um, and they kind of work in the same way as those quotes from other experts in the field that they give you a little motivation. They're really grounding um, and they remind you of why you did this work in the first place. We also have a section on journaling. Um, we've done some of this in our own lab at UCSC. It's really nice to do in a group and um, it is a form of self-care where you can reflect um, on your work and figure out how you want to move forward um, in terms of practicing self-care. We also have a resources section because we realize that even though this is a very um, inclusive toolkit, it doesn't cover everything. So we wanted to provide um, different resources where you can deepen your knowledge on these skills. And then lastly, we have community care, um, which are practically the facilitator guides where you can work um, as a group to deepen your knowledge on resiliency and human rights um, and have conversations on what this work means to you um, and why we do this work. Thank you so much, Sydney, for walking us through the guide. Uh, Monica, I wondered if you could talk us through the first unit um, and explaining for people what secondary trauma is and why we need to reduce it in this work. Yeah. Um... It's been incredibly rewarding working on this project because as Nikita mentioned, all most people have mentioned before this, um, we bring so much to digital investigative work. And um, this these units, the first one is on secondary trauma, which I many of you have touched on. Um, and so here we provide sort of a context for understanding what secondary trauma might look like within digital investigative work. So secondary trauma, um, commonly known as compassion fatigue, um, refers to physiological, emotional, psychological impacts of doing this advocacy work um, over a sustained period of time. And so um, as Nikita mentioned, um, secondary exposure to secondary trauma is a form of stimuli that uh, activates our nervous system. And we might not always know or be aware of what those effects look like. And so here you'll find um, you know, some guidance with that. And so often our bodies signal to us before maybe our mind catches on. And so we see here that you know, exposure, sustained or unmanaged exposure to secondary trauma could sometimes look like uh, hyper attentiveness or even numbness. Um, it could look like body pain um, or feel like body pain. Um, and, you know, it, it looks different depending on, on the individual. And so there's some guidance to that, but then also this unit provides tools on how to manage it. Um, and, so, and so throughout this unit, as you scroll through it, you'll find 
the resources, different kinds of uh, um, tools to to engage and to and to attend to the body while doing this kind of work. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the facilita facilitator guide, if you could walk people through how this works. Yes, so the facilitator guide is connected to the community piece of this unit um, or for each unit. So in particular, this unit is about um, like returning to one's senses and grounding oneself. And so it's connected to the, the grounding practice that you'll see in the unit. Um, and so this one is a sort of a meditation or a guided meditation um, that's, that's very sensory based. So in each facili facilitator guide, you'll find a large group, like a, a guide to facilitate like a large group check-in and then the actual practice, it's practice itself. And then it ends with uh, a check out. Um, and, so, and so you'll find, um, so here there's the audio recording um, that Nikita has recorded for us. And so um, one could just click on that and listen to it as a group. But if um, someone is feeling inspired and wants to lead a team through this uh, grounding practice, um, you'll also find a step-by-step -step that you could just go through and read. Um, what I really love about the facilitator guides is that towards the end, you'll find some uh, tips on how to facilitate these community practices, as well as um, ways you can provide more accessible language um, and invitational language when leading. Um, and yeah, so this, you'll find a facilitator guide with every unit. Well, I want to thank all three of you for helping us put together this um, incredible resource. And again, we hope um, people use it in their um, investigations, in their workplaces, in other kind of activist circles. I think one of the reasons why we felt it important to um, to to offer this to uh, the larger community is because when we're tired, and Abir kind of mentioned this, when you're tired, you can make a bad choice. And so when your body is telling you that you're tired, um, there are some uh, uh, resiliency kits here now that can hopefully um, offer um, some guidance. So thank you so much um, again for your role in producing this wonderful toolkit and for uh, sharing it with us. And again, the entire toolkit will be available as of April 15th. Um, but for now, you have access to all four units and you can um, access them directly from, um, from the Canvas page. So thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. I'd like to welcome back uh, my collaborator, Alexa Koenig. Um, thanks for uh, spending the afternoon with us in this conversation. Alexa, I don't know if you'd have some parting words that you would like to, to share. Sure, just a couple really quickly. Um, first, just in hearing all of the incredible speakers today, what really struck me was the important role, whether we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in cybersecurity practices, or we're talking about the need for greater holistic security, how acute the need is to think about individually, how we can be better empowered to take care of security for ourselves, but also the communities of which we're part how important the cultural shift is, um, that we need to effectuate that shift for a broader embrace of these holistic security practices. And then finally, the responsibilities of organizations, whether smaller teams like ours at UC Berkeley and Santa Cruz, or larger institutions such as we see in industry, to think through how we embed some of those cultural shifts through the structures that we implement throughout. Um, also, just to the audience more generally, um, you know, if you would like to support some of the work of amazing up and coming individuals from the various labs, we are always looking for fellowship and internship opportunities. There's an extraordinary pipeline of people coming out, not only from our own campuses, but the investigations lab at UCLA as well. Last, if you'd like to read more on cybersecurity or holistic security, um, the book Digital Witness was pulled together by an extraordinary community of people working in open source investigations. And of course, um, Andrea Lampros, my colleague and I are about to release Graphic, which Silvana or Dr. Falcone mentioned earlier, which will hopefully be coming soon. And I can put the link for that into the chat. Finally, thank you to Dr. Falcone for all of her extraordinary and exceptional leadership in putting this event together and for the work she's doing in the space more generally. 
Well, thank you so much um, for the partnership. We've um, really obviously have had a very good partnership for the last few years, and I have a feeling we're going to continue um, this partnership in many, many rich ways. Thank you again for coming this afternoon. Um, join us at the next UC Santa Cruz event. You'll see it there in the chat. Um, and uh, thanks again. And we wanna also acknowledge again, the uh, New Venture Fund Public Interest University uh, Technology Network for supporting our, um, our collaboration. Bye everybody.